Hey everybody, Tim back another week, another episode, ready to be in the books. I'll talk if you'll listen, episode 43, 43, and we're getting closer to episode 50, I have no idea what I'm going to do for it, so I think I'm going to touch base with a lot of people who have been around since the beginning, just to see what their opinions are, what their thoughts are, and what they would like to see for an episode 50. Should we keep it normal? Should we just keep it the same? Should we keep it trucking business as usual? Or do we make it big? Do we make it out of the box? Sometimes things end up being larger than life because we make them larger than life. And I by no means want to overwhelm myself or stress myself out. But the idea of 50 episodes and for a hobby, this is a hobby to me. I don't get paid a great amount for doing this. This isn't my full-time gig. And this is something I've been very passionate about. But at the same time, the hardest part about doing anything like this is to start. And I don't want to, I want to do the show justice, you know? I don't want to just leave it out there hanging. So I need you all to do me a favor. Shoot me your suggestions, whether you have, especially if you've been listening since the beginning. But whether you've been listening since the beginning or not, send me some suggestions. The inbox have has been pretty popular, a little bit more popular than it has been previously. And the I'll talk if you'll listen at hotmail.com inbox has also been blowing up a little bit more recently. I had somebody reach out to me to ask me about doing custom music for the show. So I'm going to reach out to them. Of course, I got my intro, as you all know, when Part of me never wants to change that. A friend did that for me as a favor. He believed in me. He believed in what I was doing. And he wanted to do that for me. That was his gift to me. So I don't think I'll ever change the outro, the intro, rather. But the outro mu- music has been varied. So if someone wants to do custom work for me, then I definitely want to entertain that. To a degree, we'll see. It could be spam. Could be someone with malicious intent, but we'll just have to see. Now, there's a lot I want to talk about today. I want to warn everybody, this is going to be a very long episode. There's a lot, some personal things going on in my life that I want to talk to you all about. There are some current events that I want to bring up and talk to you all about. And... I want to get everybody's opinion on a few different things. So very long episode, really good friend of mine, Amanda. You all have heard me mention mention Amanda's name a couple of times now, more than a few. She likes to listen to the show before work. And Amanda, I want to warn you, this episode may be pretty lengthy, so you may not be able to listen to the whole thing before work. So I don't know if you want to have it playing in the background, but to everyone out there who listens to this on the commute, who listens to this before work, who listens to this doing housework around the house, this will be a doozy. This will be a longer one. A lot of bombs I'm going to drop drop today, and I do apologize if I'm coming a little too heavy, but I like to think that's why you tune in, right? That's why you tune in. That's why you stick around. So the first thing I want to talk about is J. Cole and No Name. For those of you who don't know, J. Cole, in my opinion, is the greatest rapper in today's era right now. So we're not talking all time, obviously, but we're talking about in today's era, he has he's the greatest right now. I don't put him in the same realm as Eminem because although Eminem technically is still current and he's putting out music, he Eminem is from a different era. So you can still put out music today and still be from a different era. So I'll just put anyone who has come out since J. Cole has come out. J. Cole is better than, in my opinion. But he's a rapper, hip hop artist. And a lot of people look up to J. Cole for various different reasons. His music is very conscious oriented. His cadence is amazing. 
if anyone is really into the lyricism of rap and hip hop, you grew up listening to people like Rakim or Biggie or just those, you know, the cannabises, the M&Ms, the, the people who kind of even, even Bone Thugs and Harmony. I'll group those guys in there too. Black Thought, probably the most under, underrated rapper ever from my hometown of Philadelphia. So I am a little biased. But these guys are specialists when it comes to writing the beat. And J. Cole definitely falls into that category, in my opinion. And I think it takes people who are true fans of lyricism, true fans of cadence, and true fans of content to really recognize that. Otherwise, if you're just listening to listening to the song for the beat, for you know the feeling it gets you the emotional reaction then you may not pick up on it necessarily but a lot of people look up to j cole and there's another artist who i'm going to be honest i've never heard of ever i've never heard of this person until recently but um there's another artist by the name of no name n-o-n-a-m-e no name and she's a chicago-based artist and i haven't listened to to any of her music. So I, I couldn't tell you too much context. I couldn't tell you if I had to guess, she's probably like an R and B artist, but I have no idea. I have no idea if she is a rapper, a singer, she can make country music for all I know. I have no idea, but she has a bit of a reputation of being an activist. And I believe she owns and operates a bookstore in or around the Chicago area. And she has earned the reputation of a black activist. She's very pro-black. She's very for the people. And she and many others who know her consider her to be very plugged into the culture. She's very much in the trenches, depending on who you ask. And last month, May of 2020, if you're not listening to this right away, but in May of 2020, I believe it was May 29th, she got on Twitter which is a very public platform for a lot of people. She got on Twitter and she voiced her opinions. And I'm going to paraphrase here. And you all have been listening for long enough to know like, hey, if you really want to know about something, if you really want to get as much context as possible, this may be your first stop, but this definitely shouldn't be your last stop. You should definitely go and Google. Even if I know some people who actually pause the episode to get a little bit more context and then they pick back up. That might be a little too much effort for some people, but go and do your research if you'd like. So I'm going to paraphrase here. She had a tweet last month, which basically said, we have a lot of rappers out there who rap about and preach about pro blackness and their whole albums are presented as the quote unquote black people struggle, the black man struggle, et cetera, et cetera. And they aren't saying a word about what's going on now involving the unjustified murders of unarmed black people about the police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. And she basically called a couple of people out and she said, Hey, you people look up to you. You have a powerful platform. Why aren't you on your soapbox? Why aren't you saying things? I'm paraphrasing here, but that's essentially what her message are. She's saying these rappers out here, are so pro-black, but you don't hear a peep from them. J. Cole put out a record this week, this past week, I should say. I forget which day it was exactly. I want to say it was Wednesday night, the 17th, June 17th. But I could be wrong about it. could be a day or so off. But he put out a record, and it was a very powerful record. I enjoyed it. Although I am a little biased because I think J. Cole is great for so many different reasons. And for anyone out there who maybe thinks that it's an irrational love or it's an irrational opinion. I would love to sit down and debate you on that because I feel like I can back up my sentiments about J. Cole. But those close to me know I'm a huge J. Cole fan. I'm very much a J. Cole fan. And he put out content. Uh, he put out a song, a project, a piece of art, if you will. And he was very vulnerable. And part of the reason I like J. Cole so much is he's not afraid, especially as a man, more particularly as a black man, he's not afraid to be vulnerable at all. At all. So he puts out he puts out this song and he basically talks about how 
he's not above criticism. He'll he he's not that arrogant or that ignorant to believe that like, hey, I'm perfect. There are definitely areas of growth for him, and he knows this. And he said he's scrolling on his timeline. And, you know, there's people out there who praise him and think he's much bigger than he really is. They let his words were they're fooled by my college degree. So, in other words, he has this piece of paper with some ink on it. And a lot of his fans, a lot of his a lot of his listeners, a lot of his supporters kind of put him up on this pedestal where maybe he shouldn't be at because of his college degree. Or maybe because of the content of some of his music. And you can make the argument like, hey, they wouldn't think that if his style didn't justify that. On the other end, you could argue, yeah, he at the end of the day is a rapper. And although he can be a mouthpiece for some people, he's not a mouthpiece for in the same way that like activists are or public leaders or public speakers are. And, um, you know, he got on this record and said that and. He basically said, look, I'm not who you think I am. There's a woman out there way smarter than I am. And here's where a lot of people, I had one listener of the show reach out to me and debate, argue, you know, it's tough. Like things can be lost in context over social media. So it's tough to put a word on it. But we definitely have had a intense discussion about who J. Cole was rapping about. A lot of people out there believe it was no name, no name, excuse me, no name. And even no name felt like it was her. She even had a couple of tweets that have since been deleted where she felt like it was her. And I think it's an amalgamation. I think it's an idea of the person that no name represents. And I'll get to what I mean by that in a second. But although I do earnestly believe that no name may have been the inspiration for the certain thoughts in the song. I think J. Cole's intent, and this is the beautiful thing about art, right? Art can be interpreted by in many different ways, but I think J. Cole's intent was, hey, although this person may have sparked or fueled or may have been the foundation of these thoughts, this piece is definitely about a lot of people who fall into her category. This is a representation of this type of person. And he basically rapped about, hey, you're way smarter than I am. You're speaking from an elevated position because you're much more aware. And in the song, he had lyrics akin to. She definitely reminds me of someone who was raised in a privileged household where her parents or her peers or people she looked up to schooled her and educated her on the black person's plight and struggle in the U S of a, and just in history in general. And not everybody has had that privilege. I mentioned on a couple of episodes ago, personally, that I am very much ignorant when it comes to black history. I am very much ignorant when it comes to black history in America or black history otherwise. And I manned up to that. And J. Cole kind of said something similar to that. Like, hey, I don't know much as you do. And he basically said, like, hey, instead of speaking in a condescending tone, instead of basically penalizing penalizing us for being ignorant, for looking down your nose at us and thinking you're above us, why don't you speak to us like children and kind of uplift us? We're the same people that need to hear the message that you're putting out there and you're attacking us. Now, regardless of how you interpret it, interpreted J. Cole's piece, J. Cole's latest song. And it is out on Spotify and all of the other major platforms. I don't think it's like only on SoundCloud. It's not one of those things. It is out on Spotify. Of course, you can go to YouTube and listen as well. A lot of people interpreted interpreted it in different ways. Some interpreted it as I did. Some and other you know, others interpreted it as she he told no name to watch her tone he told her to you know spoon feed him and he told her to say hey you need to watch how you talk to me etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think a lot of people were classifying him as a misogynist and 
I wanted to key on on this for a couple of reasons. The first reason is I wanted to open the, the discussion of his piece. I think it's a very powerful piece. And I think a lot of people right now, like adults don't like to look stupid. Right. Adults don't like to look like they don't know what they're, you know, they're ignorant. They have no idea what they're talking about. Adults like to look educated or at least informed. And for anybody, J. Cole or otherwise, to get on any platform, whether it's a a small, relatively unknown podcast, like I'll Talk If You'll Listen, or whether it's this huge show like, you know, The Tonight Show or, you know, any other show or new major broadcasting, when people can get up on the stage and say, hey, I just don't know, or I'm not as educated in this topic as I would like to be, I think that's take that takes a lot of guts. I can't tell you how many people I deal with on a daily basis, whether it be at work or otherwise, who just think they know everything. Or if if they don't know, it's not their fault that they don't know. No one wants to get up and admit that they don't know. So I think regardless of how you feel about J. Cole's message, regardless of how you feel about the song, for him to get up there and say, I don't know, on a pu- such a public platform, I think is huge. But a lot of people are interpreting it as he's being a misogynist. He's telling a black woman how to speak. He's telling a woman how to talk, et cetera, et cetera. I disagree, but that's not my goal of this discussion. So as I listened to the song over and over and as I looked to social media and even read actual articles from Variety and Vanity, et cetera, et cetera. Hip Hop DX, all these different articles. I feel like the one area that people are keying in on, the one area that people don't seem to, um, that people are seem like it's it's the the figurative the figurative brick wall is the word tone, the word tone, people can't get past, and I had a post on different social media accounts about that and just to give a little bit of insight those of us who grew up in a dense urban environment and those of us who grew up specifically in a black community we know the word tone is a trigger word our parents have told us to watch our tone in a way as a way to check us whenever we're getting out of character or we're acting in a way that they deem to be disrespectful or maybe we are being disrespectful They use the word, hey, watch your tone. They use that phrase, that sentence, that delivery to say, hey, you need to watch who you're talking to. And I think that emotional response overshadows the true definition of the word or overshadows the connotation or context that people are using it in. And I'm sure you all can recall a time where we all have that one word that triggers us, right? We all have that one word that truly bothers us. We all have that one word that we can't just look past or get over for some people, young women, especially, or men who have been incarcerated. It's the B word, you know, um, female dog, if you will. And people don't like that word. They can't get past that word. Once they hear that word, they see red for some people. It's the N bomb, the N word. They see or hear that word. They, again, see red and they can't stop seeing red. They're a bull chasing the red flag. And they can't, they forget everything else. They forget every parts before or after that word. All they hear is that word. For other people, it's different words. It's curse words. It's derogatory language. I have a very close friend of mine who is in a in a relationship with, his girlfriend, and he said that they got into a big fight because he used the word stupid. Growing up, he and I would call each other silly by saying, oh, you're stupid. You're being stupid. And we would use it in a very lighthearted, very casual tone, very casual demeanor. But when he got with his girlfriend, he would do the same thing. And his girlfriend would think like, oh, you mean that you're calling me stupid. I had a discussion with a close friend today who said his girlfriend doesn't like to be told to shut up, even if it's in a playful manner. Like, are you being silly? Shut up. She doesn't like that. So you can imagine what the word tone means for a lot of people, especially women. 
where it's, hey, watch your tone, check your tone. You kind of get this in this defensive mode, this defensive, who do you think you're talking to? Watch, I'm not your, you know, servant. You know, I'm not your child. Don't tell me to watch my tone. When, in my opinion, that's not what J. Cole meant by it. But be, that one word is that, again, that figurative that figurative brick wall that people can't get past. And although I understand it, it does bother me because you miss out on the other message because of that one word. And you're pitting, you're putting your experiences with that word on J. Cole. It's not J. Cole's or anyone else's responsibility to fix your perception of a word or a situation. You need to take a look at yourself and go, what does this word mean to me? And why do I have such an adverse reaction to it? But again, in a moment, especially in a split second emotional response, you're not going to, that rational brain part of your brain isn't going to kick in, right? You're not going to go, wait, what does he mean? He's not talking about me. You just, you're going to have this knee jerk reaction and I understand it. I just don't agree with it, but I want, I encourage everybody to go and listen to this song, listen to J. Cole's message and try to hear where he's coming from. And the part that really resonates within me personally is, and I've talked about this in the past and you'll even hear a little bit about this in the interview that I do at the tail end of the show, but We have a lot of people in different areas. Um, I had an episode in the past where I interviewed a female gamer who felt like she wasn't accepted in the gaming community because men would look down on her. They wouldn't accept her. I've had discussions in the past where older people look down on younger people because they feel like, hey, what do you mean you don't know about health insurance? What do you mean you don't know about renter's insurance? What do you mean you don't know about you know, home ownership or taxes or how to file your taxes or what a primary care physician, uh, physician is. Why don't you care? Why don't you know about these things? And they kind of like look down their nose at you. And instead of bringing you up to their level, instead of having y'all see eye to eye on something, they look down on you and go, Oh, you know, better. We even talked about it in a couple of episodes ago, actually last episode with Jaleesa, when we had, a uh, a discussion about being socially aware within the black community or being aware about different things. And you have those people who are already aware. It's their responsibility in a way. You know, they're the talented 10th, right? They are the people who are educated and they know, so they should lift you up and they should never question why you don't know, because unless it's willful ignorance, they know why you don't know. For the same reason they didn't know and the parents before them didn't know. And I think that's J. Cole's message here. It's like, hey, I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to be enlightened. Teach me. Teach me your ways. Kind of reminds me of Dr. Strange speaking to the ancient one. You know, show me. (laughs) Show me. Help me become more aware. I remember having a discussion with Jaleesa. And this was the, the... the second Jaleesa interview last week because there I had two Jaleesas on, but I remember having a discussion with Jaleesa and, you know, after the discussion, I became aware and I'm like, Hey, I want to do a little bit more research. And I'm like, where should I start? And I have a few starting points and I kind of took it from there. But if Jaleesa didn't see that sincerity in my heart, if she didn't see that sincerity and me wanting to know that sincerity and my curiosity. Who knows where I would be? I would still be in a state of ignorance in some areas, you know? And I think it's, it doesn't, it's not fair to the people who want to learn. Now you do have people out there who have willful ignorance. They're just comfortable with not knowing. And they just, they just want to live their blissful life. You know, ignorance is bliss, right? They want to go out there and just live life according to them. They don't really want to be aware of much else. But for the people who want to know, for the people who want to learn and want to grow, then I think we should educate them. It's our responsibility. Why are we attacking? That kind of like grinds. Why are we attacking people who don't know as much as we do? Why do we like look down our nose at them? Why Why are we like in a way where it's like. I don't know. 
I don't want to go on a rant or a tangent, but that always that always bugged me. I can understand wanting to sit on knowledge so you can be the most important person in the room. And I can understand sitting on knowledge so maybe you get paid more. Maybe you get that promotion at work because no one knows how to do what you do. But when the tide rises, all ships rise. And if you pass this knowledge on, you're going to be the better for it. Because, you know, hey, who did you learn? Who did you learn this from? I learned this from this person. You know, they're always going to go back to you. It, it just astonishes me. Unless it's something that you're working on getting patented. <laughs> unless it's something that you're trying to make money on. It kind of astonishes me how people can sit back and go, no, this is all for me. This is not for you. And I'm I'm going to make fun of or critique you or talk down on you for being ignorant, but I'm not going to actually teach you and educate you. I think that's very counterproductive. Very much so. But yeah, I encourage you all to go and listen to J. Cole's song. And I encourage you all to just Google. All I did was simply Google J. Cole. And then I did another Google search of J. Cole and no name. And it's no space with no name. But again, Google is smarter than we are, right? So Google, if you type in a space there, it'll it'll know what you're talking about. But yeah, go check that out. Go check out that discussion and reach out to me. Let, Let me know. I'm very much active on Twitter. And obviously you can always email the show, but let me know what you think. I I would love to hear what you think about that topic. I think being condescending is very unproductive and people who are comfortable and choose to be condescending. I think they're actually, they want you to be ignorant. They'll call you out for being ignorant, but deep down inside, they want you to be ignorant because again, they want to be, they want to, they want to be that shining star. They want to be the smartest person in the room, but yeah, go check that out. So I'm going to go check on my Instagram and Facebook viewers. So I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be back in just a moment. Hey, everybody, I'm back. Thanks for bearing with the break there. And um, uh, as always, we're what, six episodes in a row now um, doing this live on Facebook and Instagram. I do encourage you all to participate because it's, it's just fun. You know, it's just fun. And it kind of keeps me on my P's and Q's. Hopefully I can um, save up on a lot of editing by doing this because it's a few mess ups when I know the pressure is on. A few mistakes. So I wanted to give everybody an update. And as you all know, I tend to be very vulnerable on these podcasts I, I I tend to be very vulnerable if I can and I try to be very revealing if I can and this is probably next to therapy probably the most personal I've gotten but I like to think of you all I've said it before I'll, I'll say it again I like to think of you all as extended family and the majority of the people listening this is their primary source of communication with me They may not be able to reach out every day and call. They may not be able to reach out every day and text. But they tune into the podcast to say, hey, what's going on in Tim's life? And unfortunately, some sad news. So my grandmother, I don't talk about family often, but my grandmother, I love and respect. And she's on her last legs, everybody. Um, The hospital wrote her a prescription for basically 10 days worth. And they're expecting her to not last past 10 days. And it's a touchy topic for me because out of all of my family members, my grandmother has been the one that I probably had the most emotional connection with. That goes beyond my connection with my late mother, my late father, any of my biological brothers and aunts and uncles even cousins. My grandmother just had a really special place in my heart. Um, She was so wise. And I was my father's only son. So when my father was murdered, I was the only piece my grandmother had left of him. 
So her and I always had a special connection. I always felt like I was her favorite, but in like a fair way. If that makes sense. Not like she build a golden throne for me, but she always made sure I had money in my pocket. I remember vivid, vividly. I remember times where me and other cousins would be in the room and she gave me the money and said, Hey, go get yourself something to eat. And I always shared it with my cousins, but she gave it to me. And whenever I talk about my family, my biological family, it's always difficult because I never really related to them. I like to think of my family as family by definition, but I'm definitely not friends with any of them. And I don't mean that in a bad way. And if any of my family is listening and if any of them are watching, I know it might be tough to hear. And this isn't me coming at you. Um, If anything, it's probably me coming at me, but just, just to set the scene for everybody. So my mother and my father weren't together. They had split custody that my father had to fight for. So don't always shun or disrespect the father who wasn't around because you don't always know his story. I know it's really easy to be mad or upset at him, especially if your mother helps to breed that hate. But you never know his story. It's not always the case of him just being a deadbeat dad. My father was incarcerated when I was born. and He came out. My mother was dealing with other men at the time. So my father wanted a paternity test to prove to her that I was his. He already believed it, but he was smart enough to know that, hey, I need a paper trail. God bless my father. Really wish I had his last name. But he came out of prison, a changed man. A child will do that for you. And he got the paternity test. And he fought for split custody. My my mother didn't want him to see me. And can you imagine what that's like? And just speaking to every person out there, we were all children and some of us were raised in single parent households. And to not know the other parent's side, I remember very vividly. In court, my mother telling me to lie to the judge so that way my father wouldn't get custody of me. And as a kid, you know, what, six years old, seven years old, I don't know any better. And sometimes as an adult, as a 30 year old adult, just thinking back on that, it's crazy to me. It's crazy for me to think that my mother really tried to engineer a scenario where I did not see my father. And she could have been another woman, bitter for whatever reason, teaching me, training me to hate my father. And I would have never known his story. My father could not have been a better father. Now, I didn't know him. He passed when I was 11 years old. So I didn't have the opportunity to get to know him. I didn't really have the opportunity to know him as an adult. I didn't have the opportunity at all to get to know him as an adult. So I'll never have those discussions with him about politics, about sex, about women, about cars, about shaving against the grain. I'll never have those discussions with him. And I found myself falling in love with the idea of my dad. Everyone loved my dad. Everyone praised my dad. He was very active in the community. He was into construction. He was a contractor by trade. So really good with his hands and taught me a lot of lessons that I didn't really realize until I became an adult. And I love my father. I respect my father. But it's more the idea of who he was. Outside of me having my own room in his house, outside of him getting a house just for me, which I don't say lightly or take lightly. And outside of 
him just essentially spoiling me, but being very fair. As a kid, I couldn't really appreciate him. I didn't have anything to compare it to. What was my point of reference? But I bring that up to add some context. My father's side of the family was all in South Philadelphia. Talking his brothers and sisters, his mom, my grandmother. And all of his nieces and nephews, my cousins, were all in South Philly. I lived in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. That's where my mother's house was. So for certain holidays, for every other weekend, and for weeks at a time in the summer, I would go down and visit my father's side of the family. And I didn't really grasp the concept of family. I would just I just knew what the words meant. This is your cousin. This is your aunt. This is your uncle. Didn't really knew I didn't really know what that meant. Just knew like, okay, this is the title to call that person. But when I was down there, I just saw me playing and being around people who looked and sounded like me. I had great moments, but I never really had the opportunity to bond with a lot of my cousins and the cousins that were a little bit older, who had big aspirations, responsible aspirations and didn't want a life in the streets. They moved away before I got a chance to get close to them. For the other cousins that stuck around, they were in and out of jail or really into the streets, whether it be drugs, whether it be violence, whatever the case may be. And some of them are really good people. You know, it's just really it's just that typical story of black boys and girls getting caught up at what's around the they're they're getting after a while you take advantage or you're at the disadvantage of what's around you. And I don't fault some of them for that. And part of the reason I feel like I couldn't have this discussion with them is a lot of them, I'm sure, aren't proud to be in the situation that they're in, whether they live with their mom or dad still, whether they don't have a, a regular job. I'm sure none of them want to be selling drugs, but there are some of them who just don't put forth that effort. You know, they're too proud to flip burgers. They're too proud to work for somebody else. They're too proud to punch a clock. Or in some cases, too lazy to. And I think it takes a very mature discussion, a very mature person to have these types of topics in a discussion. And I just never related to that. I was always a kid. I was very active outside. I loved to play. Um, I played uh, Pop Warner football. I loved to be active. I loved to race. I loved to run. I love to go on adventures. There was a game we used to play as a kid, basically the adult version of tag called Manhunt. I used to love playing that with friends in the neighborhood. And I was an avid gamer, whether it was something simple with Sonic or something complex as Fantasy Star Online. I love playing games. And unless we were at a pool party, unless we were at a Dune Day unless we were at just a block party, I never really found myself spending too much time with my cousins. You know, I never really spent too much time with them. And I think that was the, I, I didn't have that time to like relate to them. And I look about, I look at my girlfriend, I look at other people that I know, and I look at how close they are with their parents, how close they are with their family, how close they are with their extended family, how much they want that familial bond with their family members. I just never had that. And I, I think I wasn't even given the opportunity to des- to want to desire it. I couldn't desire it. I didn't even know it was something that was desirable. For all I knew, I was going down South Philly. I was seeing these people. I was being told that they were my family. In some cases, being forced to hang out with them. And I want to be very clear. I don't want to be dramatic by any means. I genuinely enjoy my time with some of my cousins. I even have a favorite cousin and she knows who she is. But 
when that happens, you feel kind of out of place. I dress differently. I talk differently. I just have different values. And we have different values with somebody. It doesn't mean your values are better or theirs are worse. It just means that they're different. And when you go down, and again, a part of me wants to warn my cousins and say, hey, this is not me coming at your neck. But there's another part of me that says, I don't really care because we don't talk that much anyway. But there are some cousins there. So I went down to see my aunt and I ran into her son, my cousin, the oldest of her sons. And he and I just had a talk for for those of you watching and listening to the show via Instagram and Facebook Live. I'm actually wearing his hat now. This is his clothing line. And he and I had a talk and I related to him in a way that I've never have related to him before. And I related to him in a way that I can count on one hand how many times I've related to my actual blood. And we were just talking about goals and aspirations about his clothing line where he and Oh, sorry about that. Here, let me turn the volume off of the laptop. But he and I were talking about where he envisions his clothing line. What's the next step? The website, the distribution, looking at manufacturers. And that's my lingo. For anyone who knows me, they know that's my lingo. Hey, what are we doing to get better? What are we doing to improve ourselves? What are we doing to hit that next level? And I love talking to him. I'll say, hey, man, I want to start wearing your stuff in my videos. I mean, your family, I want to support you. But I like your mindset. You're not, hey, wait for it to fall on my lap. You're more like, hey, I'm going to go get it. And then there was another time. This was years ago. I went down to check on my family and visit my grandmother when she was doing well at the time. And I usually make my rounds. I'll start with her and I go to different aunts and uncles and cousins house. And there's one cousin in particular who lived in, lived in his mother's basement and didn't work. He doesn't work. He just sells drugs. And, you know, there was nothing for me to talk to him about y'all just, and I don't know, I say that in a way that doesn't sound like I'm, I say, I don't think I'm better than him. I just think I'm different. It's that same scenario where, you know, a group of friends or a group of people or even your coworkers where they say, hey, the local Renaissance Fair is coming to town. And you're like, well, I am not into that. And you just don't go. That's kind of how I look at it. I don't. We all can agree that selling dra- selling drugs isn't ideal. It's not legal. It's not something that you want to build an enterprise off of in an illegal man in, in an illegal manner. But what can I talk to him about? You know, like the only video games that he play are two K, Madden, and Call of Duty. I can't talk to him about The Witcher. I can't talk to him about Overwatch. I can't talk to him about Diablo. He doesn't have a steady pay job. You know, he doesn't punch a clock. I can't talk to him about some of the challenges I have at work where, you know, hey, do I have this discussion with my boss about my promotion or. And in all fairness to him, I probably can, but I don't feel like I can. I guess that's my point in all of this. I don't feel like I can. So I never had that genuine connection long term only in moments only in random sporadic car rides home only in random sporadic moments at the bar where we shared an intimate moment a deep philosophical moment but nothing long term now part of me resents them a little bit for never reaching out to me as i mentioned earlier i lived in germantown they lived in south philly None of them called me. None of them called my mother. Hey, can I come over? None of them solicited their parents for a night at my house. Hey, can I go over to Tim's house to spend a night? None of them wanted to be a part of my world. And whether that was intentional or unintentional, 
it was still my reality. I always felt like I was the one going down. And even after my father passed, I had no legal, nor did my mother, had no legal obligation for me to go down there. I went down there purely on the strength of my grandmother. I went down purely on the strength of trying to make a relationship with them. But there were times I went down there and literally only ever seen my grandmother. I, I came home to an empty house, so to speak. Why? Some So-and-so got locked up last week. So-and-so was out in the streets. We don't know when he left. We don't know when he's coming back. And so-and-so doesn't live here anymore. We kicked him out for selling drugs. And I just never had the opportunity to relate to them as an adult. And I just felt so different. So you have this obligation. I'm your cousin. I know what that means. I'm your nephew. I know what that means. I'm your grandson. I know what that means. But do I really? One of the biggest things. One of the biggest things that my girlfriend and I bump heads on is our relationship with our families. And my girlfriend doesn't know a reality where family doesn't exist. She doesn't know a reality where family isn't there for you. She doesn't know a reality where family isn't a part of your life. It's just there. So it's tough for her to grasp the concept of me not wanting to be a part of her familial gatherings, even today. Now, obviously, I kind of wanted to be left alone because I'm dealing with some emotions with my grandmother. And anyone who has lost a family member will understand where I'm coming from when I say sometimes when you're around other people's families, you envy that situation. You start to think of your family and you don't want to be around in a really weird way. You don't want to be around positivity because it kind of reminds me, reminds you of what you don't have in a real, in a really weird way. So sometimes she's like, you know, and I know I, I feel it in her body language. I feel it in her demeanor. And she, to her credit, she doesn't come out and say it verbally, but I know she's wondering like, Hey, why don't you want to be around people who want to love you, who want to be family members for you? Why don't you want this? It's this great thing. It's this wonderful thing. It's a awesome experience. And they want you to be a part of their lives. Why don't you want to be? And that's because I experienced a life where that wasn't a thing. So it's normal for me to not want to be around family or not need to be around family. I remember one time her and I were in Walmart and she was she was freaking out because she forgot to give get her um, older sister a birthday gift and she didn't know what to get her and she's kind of freaking out. Now she freaks out about everything, but she was freaking out about, you know, the possibility that her sister wouldn't get a gift from her. And I remember just thinking to myself, I couldn't even tell you when my cousin's birthday, unless my cousin's birthday is like near mine. I have no idea when they are. There's one cousin's birthday who is in August. And the only reason I know that is because when we were a kid, we used to go back and forth about who was older before we understood the concept of you can be born in the same year, but still be younger than somebody. So that's the only reason like I vividly remember when her birthday is. It's in August. But other than that, I have no idea when my cousin's birthday are. And I'm sitting here thinking like, the concept of being anxious or apprehensive about presenting a birthday gift or getting a birthday gift for a family member is so foreign to me. I don't have any input here. There are some people who I don't want to mention my name who listen to this show and they feel the same way. They have that really weird relationship with their family if one even exists and i know some of them will be able to sympathize or empathize with my situation 
But there are some people who are so entrenched in family and so entrenched in familial bonds that they th- this concept is foreign to them. But I'll say this. Being around a bunch of people who you feel like you don't know. While your grandmother is passing away. It's such a weird feeling. I was over at my aunt's house yesterday and they, my, my grandmother is doing home hospice. So they dropped my grandmother off at my aunt's. And I remember trying to comfort and console my aunt, telling her to calm down, telling her to relax. And there was a part of me that felt so bad that I didn't know her well enough to know the best way to calm her down. That ate at me, man. Here's this woman who has to watch her mother pass away right in front of her eyes, who's supposed to be my aunt, who is my aunt. And all I can say is the normal run-of-the-mill stuff that you would tell to anybody. I didn't have any specific thing to say to her. And although my heart was in it, To genuinely have her calm down. To genuinely have her breathe. To genuinely have her relax. What could I say to my aunt? Specifically for her. That eats me, man. I'm trying my best not to get emotional here. Um, But it's just crazy to me that You can know somebody your whole life and not know who they are. Man. Hey, guys, I think I'm going to take a break right here and um, check up on my Facebook and Instagram followers and see how they're doing to see if they have any feedback and just kind of collect myself a little bit. But I'll be back right after this break. Hey, everybody, I'm back. Like I never left. And I'm sorry I got really deep and emotional last segment. But again, you all are extended family. I don't feel embarrassed or ashamed for being vulnerable with you all, for for sharing my emotions. And I think it's really important to share your emotions, especially on a day like today. Today is Father's Day. And a lot of us have different types of relationships with the men in our lives, whether that be a paternal relationship or a mentor relationship or a fraternal relationship. And obviously this day for me doesn't have as much significance to other people because although I love and respect my father, I'm not one to go on social media to say happy father's day, dad, because who's that for (laughs) Um, I have a a very uh, different philosophy when it comes to making announcements on social media, and I don't want anyone to take offense to this, and this isn't my goal to attack anyone, but I've never been a one to go on social media and say, and make a post about somebody, because in my mind, words for them are much more meaningful and impactful So I'm more of a call them personally type of thing or talk to them personally type of thing. And I think when you go on social media, you're pretty much bragging, even though I think, you know, obviously certain people aren't doing that. That's just a general perception I have where it's like, hey, you're bragging, you know, look at my situation. And I know that may be a little immature for me to look at it that way, but. I always think that a more direct one-on-one conversation is always more meaningful and impactful. And if the person that you're communicating with is expecting you to go on social media and make a whole post about them, I would question their sincerity. But, you know, my father isn't living anymore. So regardless of how you feel about afterlife, 
I'm sure in no version of any religion's afterlife or spirituality's afterlife is there a social media. <laughs> so um, I doubt that my father will be looking down on Facebook <laughs> um, or on his spiritual Facebook feed looking for my two cents. So I don't post anything, but obviously this day doesn't bear as much significance to me as it does to other people. But that doesn't mean that there aren't men in my life who are great fathers, who are amazing fathers, just all around great people. There's one particular friend of mine, brother of mine, that I've met back in 2013 when I became a Mason, and he's my line brother. But he's much older than I am. He is 20 years older than I am. And... He has been a very positive influence in my life. And I called him today and I told him that because I think it's really important for men, the men in our lives, black men specifically, to know how much we care about them, to know how much we respect them, to know what we feel about them. And I think it's even more impactful coming from another man. And I don't want to exclude the women out there, but here's what I mean. We're going to talk about it a little bit later on in the show when we get to the interview, when I have my guest on. But men in general are taught to hide or shelter their emotions. And being emotional is not masculine at all. And that you can't tell another man that you love them or care about them. So... Use the other 364 days, 365 on the leap year to express this. But if you don't use this day more than others to reach out to a man in your life and tell them how much you love and respect them. I was recently watching Dave Chappelle and I look up to Dave Chappelle so much. And I know to some of you that may seem silly. And for for some of you, it's very silly. It's extremely silly. But I look up to Dave Chappelle for so many different reasons. For his voice, for his profession. I love comedy. I love to laugh. It's one of my favorite things to do. But also just his awareness. And he's 44 years old. So he's not quite old enough to be my father. I mean, technically, I guess he could be. But he's not quite old enough to be my father. But... He has a very fatherly figure demeanor. And he he talks about very various different things that I feel like a lot of young black men need to hear and listen to. And I was watching this special on Netflix about when he got the Mark Twain Award. And I watched so many people get on stage and talk about him. And how they feel about him and how much they respect respect him and admire him and look up to him and how he's a mentor. And I thought about, like, who's like that for me? You know, obviously, my father was like that and my father would still be like that. I don't have a shadow of a doubt that that would be the case. And I was in mentor programs growing up and I've had mentors throughout my different um, jobs or different stages of my career. But there was nobody quite like my friend Charles. And this isn't the same Charles that I call Chuck, my uh, friend Chuck. This is my fraternity brother, Charles. And, you know, he, he does a great job of just teaching me, guiding me. He does a great job of holding me accountable. And his communication skills are just phenomenal. And... He's definitely a father figure. Um, I once knew a guy who was too proud to call call another man dad or too proud to say another man could be a father figure. It was just an ego thing with him. And although I'll never call another man dad unless I get married and, you know, and it's a father-in-law situation. Charles, at this point in my life anyway, is the closest to that mark. So I called him up. I talked to him about it. And... You know, I made sure that he knew how I felt about him. And I think he knows, but I'm sure he doesn't get tired of hearing it. And 
for anyone out there, you know somebody who fulfills that void for you in some capacity. You wouldn't call them dad. You don't consider them a father. But they have certain father-like attributes that they've instilled in you. And you respect them as such. So I encourage you to reach out to them, especially on a day like today. And just let them know. They'll be better for it. They'll appreciate it. And they'll be able... It's much more meaningful when you say it to a person why they can still understand it versus someone who's in a comatose state or worse yet an urn or a gravestone or tombstone rather just throwing that out there comedy is so important to me I brought this up when speaking about Dave Chappelle but comedy is so important to me because like podcasting it's an opportunity it's an avenue for people to say and discuss whatever's on their mind. And the thing that's beautiful about comedy and podcasting, Dave Chappelle said it, where they're on some stage behind some mic somewhere, there is a champion for you. There's someone who feels exactly like you do, who can be a mouthpiece for you, who can talk and articulate and showcase things that maybe you don't know how to, you know, quite how to do. There's someone out there for you, voicing their opinions, fighting for your right to have one. And I think it's one of the last sacred arts, man. Like we live in this whole cancel culture age. And it really bugs me that we can't say what we want to say. And I can't tell you how many social media warriors out there or, and I don't want to sound like an old man, but. How many people out there where it's like, I don't agree with you said, I don't, I don't agree with, I don't agree with what you said. I don't like what you said. I disagree with what you said. So therefore you need to be canceled. You don't need to do another show. We don't need to buy, buy tickets anymore. And there were people actually saying the same thing about J. Cole earlier in the show. We talked about his record. There were a lot of people out there saying, hey, cancel J. Cole. And I think that's crazy where it's like, hey, I don't want you to be able to put food on the table because I don't agree with what you said. I think that's crazy that we're so sensitive as a culture. We've reached a point where we're so sensitive and we're so obsessed with our own opinions that if someone gets, again, say that whether it's Donald Trump as polarizing as some of his statements are or whether it's your local politician. The fact that we can get up here and say, hey, screw this person's policies, screw this person's lifestyle, screw everything else about this person. I don't like what they said in this instance, or I don't like these instances where they said certain things. So cancel them. They should lose their job. I don't want them to be able to put food on their table anymore. And I think comedy and podcasting, although not immune to this cancel culture, is definitely one of the last sacred playgrounds to get on your platform, to get on your soapbox, to get on your your pedestal and speak freely and say what you got to say. It's one of the last sacred places to do that. And this is one of the things why, one of the reasons why I love this art so much. I love this thing so much. I can get on here and basically say whatever I want. And of course, you're always responsible for your words and you always have to deal with the consequences. You, you, The moment you say something, you're creating an opportunity for someone to form an opinion about it. And you can't control what, you know, people think or feel and you can't control how people take something. But at the end of the day. If you're listening and you've been on that side, and I know a few of you have been, and I've been involved in some personal conversations with you all, where you feel like, hey, this person should be canceled because I don't like what they said, or I don't support this person because I don't like what they said. I want you to know it's their right. I'm, I'm sorry. I want you to know it's your right. It's your right to have that opinion. It's your right to feel that way. But it's also that person's right to say and do whatever. 
Now, again, if you get up and you say something extremely racist or derogatory or discriminatory, obviously it's your right to say that, but you also got to deal with the consequences. But I think the consequences in this culture, in this day and age, have been totally blown out of proportion. And there's no middle ground. It's no, hey, we deserve an apology. It's no, hey, give this person the opportunity to clarify. It's no, hey, let's go look for more context. It's let's take a snippet of what this person said. Let's make a headline out of it. And let's form an opinion based on two minutes of an hour long discussion. It's crazy to me. Cancel culture is real. It's pathetic. And it's very scary. Very, very scary. One of the last things I wanted to talk about before we get into the interview is the Confederacy. And I know a lot of you are like, hey, where are you going with this? But this ain't going to be too long. It's kind of an arbitrary thought. And I was going to do some research on the Confederacy and give you some facts and everything like that. But Confederacy has only been around for five years. And I just want to say this thought and get it out there and and bring forth into discussion. There are a lot of people out here who take pride in the, the Confederacy and they say it's a part of the culture. The South was a thing before the Confederacy. It was one small sliver of history. So if anyone is clinging, in my opinion, if anyone is clinging onto the Confederacy, they're clinging onto the flag and what it means and what it represents. I think they're choosing to be ignorant of the racist tone that comes with that flag and that period and that era. And I think they're choosing to disregard other people's opinions and viewpoints about what that flag means. And if anyone, if anyone sits back and go and says to themselves, Hey, this is a part of our history. We should praise it. We should talk about it. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with that person and see where their head is at. Because I think they're using the Confederacy as an excuse to practice racism or be racist or to justify racism. I think it's crazy. They don't cling to the Industrial Revolution. They don't cling to different other, you know, other points in history like they do the Confederacy. And I think that's very telling. I saw a couple of posts online about people getting up in arms about certain racists, racist figures, their statues being pulled down different parts of the country and a lot of people pitching a fit about it. I can understand you saying, hey, this is a part of our history. We had this person up. But you need to take a step back and see what that person represents to other people. And what that person was about. If I invented our sanitation system, but also was a horrible, horrible human being who raped, pillaged, and murdered, I don't think you should build a statue for me. If I reduced crime in a revolutionary way by eight people on a regular basis, I don't think you should build build a statue for me in my honor. So screw what the person discovered Screw what the person fought for. If they owned slaves, if they were pro-slavery, and if they were a very racist person, or if they were uh, a racist group of people, probably shouldn't have a statue about that person out of fear of what that might represent. Just saying. Just something to think about. So I'm going to take one more break. I'm going to check in on my Facebook and Instagram followers. And then I'm going to check back in with you all and give you an intro to the interview. Just one moment. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I appreciate it. Definitely have to show the viewers some love. So this next topic, again, if you listen to last week's episode, you know that I definitely wanted to keep it black oriented. So this next topic was a topic that's very relevant in the black community. And it's about masculinity, masculinity in general. And the reason I wanted to talk about masculinity is because I remember very much what it was like for me growing up. 
um, not really understanding what was masculine and what wasn't and not understanding the concept of masculinity and feeling like there were certain thoughts, feelings or emotions that I couldn't exhibit because that quote unquote was too feminine or it was like it was too much like being a girl, quote unquote. And I had no one teach me how to be masculine. I had these ideas of what masculinity was based on um, the men that were around me, whether that be a rapper, whether that be a neighborhood drug dealer, whether that be whomever. That's what my idea of masculinity was. And I remember listening to what most people don't realize about men is the heterosexual men anyway, is that we'll do almost anything for a woman. We'll do almost anything for a woman's attention because we want to have that woman's woman's attention. And I remember hearing so many things from the women that I grew around, grew up around on what they found attractive, what they found as manly or masculine. And I tried to emulate that without even fully understanding what it was. My goal was to get their attention. In some cases, my goal was to get in their pants. So I wanted to be marketable to them. I wanted to, hey, what about me is desirable? Let me exploit that. Let me exemplify that. And this concept of masculinity was so foreign to me, but here I am trying to be masculine. I did a little bit of research on this topic and... I saw a few polls and the general consistent consistent uh, consensus was most boys know what they want to be in life or know what job they want to have before most women do. And a reason for that is we get these ideas shoved down our throats on what we're supposed to be. From my experience, I know there are a lot of people out here who are going to listen to this and say, hey, that's not true. But you got to keep in mind, this is my experience. This is my reality and many others just the same. From my experience in my childhood, girls were told that they could grow up to be whatever they wanted to be. They could be a doctor. They could be a lawyer. They could be an engineer. They could be a teacher. They could be a basketball star, you know, an athlete, a stay at home mom. They could be whatever they wanted to be. Men, we were told we had to be involved in a profession that bought home the dough, bought home the money. Or we had to be something that required a lot of manual labor. We had to be a police officer. We had to be a firefighter. We had to be something that was very entrenched in the sciences. We had to be an astronaut. We had to be a physicist. Things of these nature. So you can understand how being a boy going like, hey, I don't really have a choice. I have to pick these things. And in certain urban environments, you had to be a rapper, a drug dealer, or an athlete. Those were your choices. You didn't really have many men in lab coats in the neighborhood. You didn't see many men who were politicians coming home from work with that briefcase and that blazer. You saw the guy on the corner who had all the girls with a really nice car. That was masculine. That was some sort of occupation. That was the goal. My next guest, he and I, And this is a repeat guest. We talked about this at length and I don't want to spoil or ruin a lot of the interview, but there were some things that I wanted to reference that I wanted to speak about and I wanted to mention it here. So here's an article that I found. This is from the Pew Research um, Center and Its title is Americans views on masculinity differ by party, gender and race. It's not too old. It was published last year. And I just wanted to read this article to you all. 
just to let you know that, hey, while women are being told how to be feminine, you know, men aren't necessarily being taught how to be masculine per se. We're just being told like, hey, this is what masculinity is. And everyone has this concept. So check this out. I'm going to read this whole article. It's not too long. I am going to read it. And I would love to hear what you all think. And again, if you want to reread this, this is from the Pew Research Center. And again, it is titled Americans Views on Masculinity Differ by Party, Gender and Race. New guidelines from the American Psychological Association warning against traditional masculine ideology and a viral Gillette ad have sparked a national conversation about men and masculinity. With some saying concerns about masculinity, excuse me, masculinity should be taken seriously and others denouncing what they see as an attack on masculinity. A 2017 Pew Research Center survey found that about half of Americans, 53%, say most people in our society these days look up to men who are manly or masculine, with women more likely than men, 62% versus 43%, and Democrats more likely than Republicans, 58% for Democrats, 47% for Republicans. To hold this view, about two-thirds of men who say society looks up to masculine men, 68%, say this is a good thing. A narrower majority of women, 56%, say the same. Views differ more widely along party lines among Republicans and Republican-leaning independents who say society values masculinity. 78% say this is a good thing. Compare it with 49% of their Democratic and Democratic-leaning counterparts. Relatively few men, 9%, say it's very important to them personally to be seen by others as manly or masculine, while 37% say this is somewhat important to them. Black men are more likely than white and Hispanic men to say it's very important that others see them as very masculine. 23% of black men say this versus 7% of white men and 8% of Hispanic men. So I want to pause there for a second. Being masculine is very important in the black community, so much so that you get made fun of a being a, being a homosexuality, you know, I'm sorry, being a homosexual, being gay as a kid. If you do anything slight, like even hug a guy, or tell a guy I love you, you're deemed as gay and you are not a man or at least not manly. So when I say that this couldn't be, this is very, very true. Being masculine is very important within the black community. And the article goes on to say, and while about one in 10 Republican and Democratic men say this is very important to them, Republican men are more likely to say it's at least somewhat important to them to be seen as very masculine, 51% versus 42%. When it comes to how men view themselves, about three in 10 or 31% say they are very manly or masculine. 54% describe themselves as somewhat masculine And 15% say they are not too or not at all masculine. Again, race is linked to views about this. 49% of black men consider themselves to be very masculine compared to uh, compared with 34% of Hispanic men and 28% of white men. Views also vary by party with Republican men more likely than Democratic men to describe themselves as very masculine. 39% versus 23%. The survey also found that many men say men face at least some pressure to engage in activities that are sometimes associated with traditional masculinity. More than 8 in 10 say men face pressure to be emotionally strong, with 41% saying men face a lot of pressure in this area. They ain't lying. About 6 in 10, 57%, say men face pressure to be willing to throw a punch if provoked. 45% say men face pressure to join in when other men talk about women in a sexual way. And 40% say men face pressure to have many sexual partners. They are not lying, y'all. I can't tell you how many people feel like, especially women, and I'm going to call women out on this a little bit. Some of you may not like this, but hey, it is what it is. I can't tell you how many men, I'm sorry, women expect their men to immediately get violent to come to their aid to protect them. 
instead of, you know, any other outcome or any other scenario. It's automatically violent. A lot of pressure on men to do that. And whether you feel that way or not, it's definitely a reality. The survey also explored views about femininity. Overall, Americans see society placing less premium on femininity than on masculinity. 32% say most people in society these days look up to women who are womanly or feminine, while 11% say society looks down on them. A majority, 57%, say society neither looks up to nor down on women who are feminine. Still, women are more likely to say it's very important to them personally to be seen by others as feminine than men are to say the same about others seeing them as masculine. One in five women say it's very important to them to be seen as womanly or feminine. 32% say it's somewhat important. So that's the end of the article. And I wanted to read it in full just to add some context here that it's very important, specifically in a black community to be considered as masculine. It's a very important thing, a very, very needed or strong requirement. Our next guest talks about this. We have an open discussion. I think it was very insightful. And this was a delight. It was a great topic. I love talking to him about it. And I can't wait to hear you all thoughts and you all's feedback on it. Without further ado, here is the next guest on the show, Maurice. Welcome back, everybody. I really like these interview segments, and I'm pretty happy that I can at least bring them back or at least start to bring them back in a semi-regular way. And this is a pattern that's been going on lately because we have another repeat guest. Uh, we have a good friend of mine, longtime friend, and for a specific period, a longtime co-worker, and we've grown close over the years. Um, you may remember this guest from our discussion surrounding black therapy. Um, and uh, therapy within the black community and just men in general. Um, I'd like to welcome back Reese. Hey, Reese, how you doing, man? Hey, what's going on, Tim? Hey, uh, listeners, how you guys feeling? Hope all was well with you, and I hope the fireworks aren't killing y'all too much around this time of year. <laughs> oh, man. If, if anybody lives in the, the Philadelphia area, uh, yeah, they, people, I don't know where they got these fire. I, hey, Reese, I think they spent their stimulus checks on fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> they got quotas in me, man. Uh, we were <laughs> offline, offline, everybody. Um, and I apologize if this interview gets a little goofy. It's just Reese and I have great chemistry. Uh, offline, Reese and I were talking about a previous job and how our districts were divided. Hey, Reese, I think they have firework districts within the city, and maybe they're competing. <laughs> <laughs> they got district managers and like, oh, we need to get our numbers up, y'all. You know, South Philly beating us. You know, we can't have that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so the purpose of uh, today's discussion is to really – I wanted to close out June since this will be the last episode for June, and there's a lot of blackness in June. I love it. Um, a lot of strong – black culture, strong black awareness. Last week was centered on the African-American woman, the black woman, the dark skin, light skin, brown skin woman. Um, and we kind of gave you a little bit of uh, insight and window into their world. I wanted to take an opportunity to do the same thing for our black men, for anyone out there who either can't articulate their thoughts or um, can't, um, or, or are unaware of our plight. We so um, I wanted to talk about uh, masculinity in general and how that what that was like for us growing up. So, with, as a kid, you know, being raised, did you have any idea of what masculinity was? Did you understand that concept at all? Uh, I would say that um, there there's kind of like the perceived thing, which is masculinity, and I think as an adult, which you kind of figure out is true, quote unquote, uh, masculinity. And I think as a kid, my concept of masculinity was like, I could think if you could picture like a, a army person or like a Marine, big and strong and never talking and, you know, able to beat anybody up who says something wrong to him and really emotionally cold and, 
you know, uh, emotionally, like, just distant in general. And that was kind of like my concept of masculinity as a kid. It's like, well, I could get a bunch of muscles and never cry and never talk about my emotions and beat anybody up who approached me, then I'm a masculine guy. Um, I think as I've gotten older, I've learned that, you know, those are probably the opposite of what I would consider uh, a masculine man. But my 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 view as a kid and my view as an adult of what masculinity is are two completely different things. Wow, that's really insightful. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, these kids, these boys, these young black boys have a, misconce- a misconception of what masculinity is. And I think as a society, we do a really poor job of taking accountability. And I think a lot of times we want to point the finger at any and everything else other than the people or the things that matter. And if you let society tell it, it's media, right? It was the rappers we watched growing up, the 50 Cent, the Tupac. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it was the showboat lifestyle, the Diddy, the LL Cool J. Um, and what I think uh, it'd be really irresponsible to dismiss, like, the, the men in our lives or to dismiss our environment or even to an extent some of the young women or not so young women in our lives that uh, molded our perception of what masculinity was um do you think anything around you in particular played a huge part on what you thought masculinity was as a boy or do you think society is right it was the 50 cents it was the Tupac, etc um i think a combination of the two so i think that um of course like hearing rappers you know especially as, a, as an African-American, you know, growing up, the only black people you really see on screen were, like, rappers and athletes. So you see a, um, in a, 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 a 50 Cent getting on there talking about how many girls he gets and, you know, how much he drinks and parties and how much money he makes and things like that. And you kind of equate black success to that image in which the rap, rapper has painted. Um so growing up, you kind of aspire to do this. And Tim, I'm sure you can attest to this, that almost every black person knows a black person who was trying to be a rapper. Like, you get to high school, after high school, like, oh, I'm going to make it big as a rapper. And that's fine. I'm not saying don't have goals and aspirations. But uh, I don't know if you ever watch Judge Masters. Whenever someone comes on Judge Masters and they say they want to be a rapper, he always says you should have a backup plan. Like, so I think that, that you know, if you're – if you you can't dribble a basketball, if you can't catch a bas- football, um, or if you're not specifically gifted musically, it's, it's tough to get, like, a real image of what masculinity is as a young black boy, you know, living in the inner city of Philadelphia. A hundred percent, and I totally agree with you. If you didn't know somebody who wanted to be a rapper or was an aspiring rapper, then you were that rapper. Um, I mean, right. <laughs> that's that's what it was. Um, you got bars too. Many, I do. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just actually going to say, um, a lot of the people who are listeners right now, they haven't known me. They they met me after high school. I'll put it that way. Mm-hmm. But you know, um, I know some of them. This is extreme. It'd be extremely foreign to them because of the image that they see of me today. But no, I was that kid. You're a hundred percent right. And <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to discuss the topic a little bit more in this episode. Um, as everyone listening knows, these interviews are pre-recorded before the episode is. But you're 100 percent right. To me, rap was black success. 100 percent. I couldn't. I had no dexterity, uh, so I couldn't dribble a basketball, let alone shoot one. Um, I was too. Fr- My body was, in general, a little bit wasn't built. I didn't have the genetics for football. Um, I was very agile. But I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like a Barry Sanders or anything. Um, And, you know, you're 100% right. You have these images, these archetypes, if you will, of what success was. And it's kind of like, you know, any, many, money, mo. You're a black kid. You sit down. You look, okay, what are my options? Give me that one. And my that one was rap. You're 100% right because of what we thought was successful, what we thought was masculinity. I think – the black, I, I don't want to pick on the black community, and I don't want the people listening to get a perception that we're picking on the black community. I think I just want to provide insight into that world for people who don't necessarily have it, specifically in a dense urban environment, like you said, like the city of Philadelphia. I think there's a certain expectation that never really gets communicated 
for black boys and what they're expected to grow into. In your opinion, what do you think the black community, the, the black community's expectation is when it comes to black boys growing into black men? Oh, my gosh, man. Uh, where do I start? So I think that, and this is, I'm, I'm someone who I've never been to jail. Um, I don't have no athletic scholarship. I actually went to college on an academic scholarship. Um, and I think that awesome. in talking to older African-American men, um, and men my age, and if I say, oh, I never smoked weed, I never went to jail, they're like, oh, you grew up shelter. Oh, you must have been privileged. You know, things like wow. that is what I've received personally from my own community. Right, so I think that when when you get black boys, it's almost this expectation that they grow up, go down the wrong road, and then have a eureka moment and kind of like get to the right path at some point in their late twenties, you know, or thirties, if they, you know, manage to live that long. Unfortunately, as it sounds, and I think that um um the 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 struggle there is there are kids who aren't necessarily into that lifestyle of selling drugs, of playing at like there are some kids who are just rather sit in the house and play video games and, you know, due to whatever in, environment it is that they grew up, due to what they see pushed at them in the media, um, due to how they feel as though they should behave like they, they don't feel like they could be themselves and they transform into like these images of of what what they've seen and these images that have been painted out to them. Um, even if you do hang around older black men, um, if they're, if you're around a group of them and they're talking about how many girls they got and laughing and joking and busting it up about that and talking about how much money they made and we live in old crime stories, you still kind of see that and it gets in your head and you're like, that's the path that I must want to go down because, you know, as a kid, it's rare that we look at the adults who take the time to like kind of pour into our lives. I just take time at all to spend with us and say, Oh man, this is someone that I don't want to be like, like be like, Oh, this person, you know, seems pretty cool. They've made it, you know, they're doing it. You may not know their full story. And then you kind of hear them talking. They're like, Oh yeah, you know, I used to do blah, blah, blah. You're like, Oh, that's the path I have to take to be like so-and-so. So I'm going to follow in those footsteps. Mm. And I, I think that, that, that tends to be what happens a lot with our young boys. Um, growing up in in addition to just kind of like just this perception that that at some point you got to go down like completely down the wrong path to get to the right path or you grew up sheltered or privileged or whatever the case may be i think that's incredibly insightful reese and mm -hmm. the biggest takeaway i can take from that is we're given these expectations but we aren't given the, the roadmap to get there a hundred percent we're told you need to be successful we don't get a definition of success necessarily. We get images, um, and that becomes our definition. We get told, hey, you need to be wealthy. You need to make money. You need to have your own house. You need to have, you know, and before we even talk about, you know, heterosexuality and homosexuality within the black community, mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're told, like, hey, instead of be with who you want to be with, you know, love who you want to love, hey, get as many women as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and never settle down or whatever the case may be. Or if you do settle down, like, hey, get a wife. But we're never – so, like, hey, make sure this young lady's head is on straight before you settle down with her. Or, hey, you know, young ladies will go to respect you if you respect them. And, you know, or, hey, this is how you get a house. You got to get your credit. Mm -hmm. none, of, none of that. And I think – and I know I've mentioned this in the past in previous episodes, but – we kind of get to this really weird gray area. Like you have a little small window of opportunity to ask these questions of the older black people in the black community because if you ask when you're too young, hey, what's the credit score? Hey, how does insurance work? Hey, what's a deductible? Mm -hmm. What's a copay? Why do I need homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance or any of these things? Oh, you're too young. You'll, you'll learn about that when you get older. And then, you know, when you're in your 20s, when you're probably getting your first apartment, when you're probably getting your first serious relationship, when you are probably considering home ownership or these different areas, when you are scheduling your own doctor's appointments and you got to deal with insurance now, you go and ask that older black mentor, that older black leader, hey, um, I called and 
I tried to set up a, a appointment, um, and he asked me who my primary care physician was. I don't know what that is. What do you mean mm. you don't know what that is? Like, that's mm. crazy. How old are you now? And it's like, well, mm. I asked you when I was 14, and you told me I didn't need to know about it. Now that I'm 24, I'm too old. Oh, I had to ask when I was 17. That's what it was. I'm sorry I didn't get that memo, you know, and – um, you're 100 percent right. We're, we're given we're given the roadmap, we're given the destination, but we're not we're not given the rules and expectations. Um, this is a very interesting topic, Reese, and I think I think you provide a really good a lot of good talking points. And I feel like we can go on this forever, but just one last question for you: As a black boy, you get all these images of what to look up to and what to aspire to. You would think that we would internalize that. And when we grow to be fathers, that we would want to be that person for our sons, for our daughters, et cetera. Where do you think black men in general drop the ball at when it comes to fatherhood? What do you think um, is necessarily our fault or what do you think is a result of the environment that we grew up in? Uh, man, I try to keep this uh, quick. Uh, <laughs> there's so many ways I could go with this. I'll take your time, um, I, brother. Take your time. <laughs> I think that that largely speaking, black men in general, um, when you become a father in general, I should say, not just black men, you're not always at a point where you're the wisest individual. So, like, I was 20 when I became a father. I'm 32 now. So, mm-hmm. I mean, a 20 year old's wisdom isn't the same as a 32-year-old's wisdom, right? So the things I valued at 20 might have been, you know, oh, getting girls and doing this. So um, raising a child at that young of an age, your mindset is kind of off. And, I mean, I'm blessed to be one of the ones who – I'm blessed to be in a situation where where um, I was kind of able to, to, to stay guided and stay focused through that time. But there are some people who you see 30, 40, 50 year olds who still are like out there chasing women and, you know, still selling drugs and still running the streets and still doing, you know, things like that. And we have this, this, this thing that you hear a lot in the, um, black community where it's just like, oh, I'm okay. Oh, I went through this. So I was all right. You know, oh, well, they did it to me growing up. So, and you kind of feel like, oh, well, because my mom and dad might not have you know, done this for me, and I came out okay. It'll be okay if I do this to my child. Um, and, like, that's, like, where I would say it begins that I think that we need to do a better job of protecting our children from some of the traumatic experiences that we had growing up. Um, like, for example, my mom and dad fought and argued, like, pretty much my entire life. Um, and when my son was born... One of the first things I ever said to his mom was I said, I will never argue with you in front of him. Like, I will never. Like, we will not argue. If I get to the point where I'm getting frustrated, I'll even leave the room. We come back another time, but I'm not arguing with you in front of him. And that's something that that I've stuck because I didn't want him to have those same experiences as me. Um, So I feel like as a community, we just have to do a better job of saying, okay, I felt this way when this happened to me. Rather than saying, I felt this way and I survived it, so if my child feels this way, they'll survive it too like I did. You have to shield your children, shield the boys and the young ladies from some of those experiences that that we had that hurt us, that scarred us, that left us sad, that left us crying, that, you know, have us in positions where we need therapy and we need um um medications and things like that to deal with things if we do a better job of shielding our black kids um from some of these traumatic experiences then um i think that that we'd be in a but that, i think that's a place to start you know for to, to to change the image wow that's that's really deep um i'm gonna I'm go i know we didn't talk about this offline Reese, but this is just so good um i want to go off script here a little bit uh Watching your parents argue in front of you every day, what type of impact do you think that had on you? Well, I can tell you now, like, I'm really emotionally distant as an adult, and I'm really fully conflict as an adult. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that that's where that stems from. Like, 
and when I sense something's getting, like, riled up or conflicty or if I sense myself getting frustrated, I'm really quick to dismiss myself from the situation rather than um, engage or do something like try to crack a joke to kind of lighten up the, the mood or environment or just kind of like, okay, you got it, you know, like dismissive of it. Um, that's a huge impact that that had on me. Um, and even in a relationship sense, when things need to be discussed, be it, you know, I, I had a girlfriend at one point, I just used to always say she was right because I just didn't want to argue with her. Like, wow. everything, even if I knew, like, with 100% certainty I was right, if I sensed it going into the direction of, of an argument, I was just like, you're right, I'm sorry, just to avoid wow. it. And it's not healthy, but, again, that was kind of the way that I've learned to deal with it growing up. And it wasn't until maybe a few years ago that I was like, okay, you got to approach some of these conflicts. You can't avoid them your whole life. They're going to happen. So, you know, in more recent years, I've been working on how to navigate through them in a calm manner. But I would say for the majority of my 20s, like, I would not argue at all. <laughs> wow. Wow, man, that's deep. And, you know, I can't help but to think, like you mentioned, what would have happened if you've been shielded from that arguing? And I'm not a parent, so I can't say for certainty, but I like to take an educated guess that one of the toughest things as a parent is to decide, hey, what do I expose my children to and what do I shield them from? Mm -hmm. I saw a quote that was really powerful to me that said, people are usually one of two ways. They are, hey, I experienced that pain. It was so bad. It was so horrible. I never want anyone else to experience what I went through. So I'm going to do my best to protect that person. And the other side of that is going through that experience, going through whether it be public school, going through, you know, a single parent household, whatever it is, going through a drug ravaged community, I came out better for it and it made me who I am today. So yeah. I went through it. Why shouldn't they? Yeah. And the crazy part about it is both philosophies are right. Right. I think the difficult part is is when to pick and choose. So okay. last question I have for you, and I, this has been so good up until this point, so I promise, last one. <laughs> last question I have for you is as a parent, as a black man, when do you make that decision? When do you make that decision of, hey, I went through this, and this is what it taught me, so – you need to go through it as well, or I went through that and it was traumatizing, and you you shouldn't go through that, so I'm going to shield you through it. Uh, when do you make the distinction? Um, if I think that at the point that my son's 11 now, so maybe around the time that he starts to like get to like the actual dating age, I'll have a sit down and let him know. You know, these are some of the things that. I experienced growing up, um, it's still my desire to shield him. Like, I don't think that he should experience that at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think to have an honest conversation, which I don't think we have a lot as well, to say, okay, here's what I went through. Um, here's what I saw my parents doing. Um, you know, like, you, your grandma is a great woman, you know, which is not to tear down the family. So I do think that part of the reason we avoid these conversations, right, is because people feel attacked when you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, a wrongdoing that they might have done or, you know, something that they might have dealt with. So, I mean, I'll put it on a record. Like, I love my mom. Uh, my dad's been dead for 10 years now, but love my dad. I love my mom. They were both awesome individuals. Um, I just didn't mesh the best from a romantic standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. But they were both awesome. So I have to put that out there every time I say it because I, I know my mom will listen to this and I don't want to get no angry text messages. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> I think that we have to do a better job of rather than staying silent about some of those things, talking to our children about it. Like, no, like this is what I dealt with growing up and this is why I'm this way about this way, tropic. This is why I, um, I think one time you taught me when we worked together, people need to understand the why sometimes. So you can tell somebody, I can say, Oh son, uh, don't talk back. But sometimes you got to explain why, you know, you're telling someone not to do something. So I think you have a sit down, hey, son, you know, daddy grew up around a really, really, really uh, 
conflictful, if that's the word, conflictful environment. And um, that's part of the reason that, you know, I'm so calm around you, that I'm so patient with you and things like that. You know, you're not going to be able to avoid arguments, but here's a better way that you can navigate through those emotions when you get angry, when you get upset. Um, and these are just my experiences that I'm trying to shield you from so that he's aware of some behaviors. Um, I think when you make people aware of why you behave in a certain manner, they're way more understanding and way more respectful of what it is. But like I was saying earlier, we tend to shield like, oh, I can't talk about how mommy and daddy used to fight all the time because mom's going to get mad or dad's going to get mad or, you know, cousin so-and-so is going to get mad or they're going to feel like you're ripping the family apart when that's just not the case is, you know, speaking your truth. Um, and, you know, like I had something that came up with the other day, like, you know, you may not want to accept my reality, but it's still my reality, you know, and if that's my reality, if that's the experiences that I went through, holding it in isn't going to get me anywhere but more emotionally scarred. So at a certain point, you have to talk about it, which could go back to the therapy conversation, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> Indeed. Right. Indeed. Wow. Uh, Reese, it's just an absolute pleasure um, talking with you, man. And um, I had some repeat guests before, and it's just like I told uh, Jaleesa last week and talking to her that no one's been known three times yet. So we'll see who – it's a race. Um, we'll see who will be the third time. But whether it's three times or 50 times, I'm sure um, our conversations will be fruitful and, and very passionate. And I'm very appreciative to have you on, man. And before I let you go, um, you did recently start a YouTube channel. And yeah. it's very similar to the conversations that we have right now. And did you want to talk about that a little bit or – or give people uh, yeah. a little bit of insight? Yeah, I'd do a quick plug. Um, so my my channel is called My Brother, My Brother. Um, just a channel that I came up with to uplift uh, men. Uh, the focus has been on men of color because I just so happen to be a black man, but it's not only supposed to be towards black men. Um, it's just men everywhere. My goal is to encourage and uplift men. Um, one mel at a time. Actually, um, on Father's Day, I went live and, you know, I welcomed some people to come on and shout out a male that they know, celebrate a male that they know, uplift the male that they know, things along that nature, just to kind of increase the love and what I view as true masculinity, you know, the ability to tell a fellow man, to tell a friend, to tell a male brother that you love them, that you appreciate them, that you care about them. So that's my brother, my brother, no fancy spellings or anything like that. Um, or you can look me up by my first and last name on Facebook. Um, I stream live every other Wednesday, 7 p.m. Uh, this Wednesday, I'll be doing an episode at 7 p.m. live on YouTube and my Facebook page. Awesome, awesome. That's wonderful. And I actually just recently subscribed to your show, and I'm really excited to be a part of the discussion because you're absolutely right. I think there are a lot of opportunities for men, and instead of looking down our nose at them and shunning them of their shortcomings, sometimes you do have to talk to people in a way like, hey, this is what you did wrong, or this is where your area of opportunity is, and hey, this is where you're doing well. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for your journey. I'm really excited for your show. And one created to another, man, good luck. I really I really do hope the best for you. Um, that said, Reese, always a pleasure in having you on. I can't wait to talk to you in the future. And until until the next time, brother. All right, Tim, it's always a blast, man. Always a blast being on your show. Thanks for having me. It was such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful discussion. I encourage you all to go check out Reese's YouTube channel. There are a lot of eye-opening and insightful discussions over on his show. And I'm definitely going to look, link up to him, link up with him to be on the show. Because these are topics that people need to talk about. I think there are a lot of sides of men that often don't get viewed. And I think a lot of men are viewed as the bad guy um, in a lot of different situations. Because how can men be victims Depending on who you ask, we live in a, you know, a patriarchy and men rule the world and run the world. And that may be the case in some areas, but because of that narrative, people can't see men as vulnerable or as victims or as someone who needs support or as people who need support. So I really appreciate the discussion from Reese. 
I appreciate the topic. And again, I encourage you all to create the discussion. Reach out to somebody you know and say, hey, do you expect me to be masculine if you're a man? And if you're a woman, reach out to someone to know and say, hey, do you feel obligated to be masculine? Is that a thing? What does masculinity mean to you? And you'd be surprised. Reese also talked about a few things um, from our perspective of being black boys, of being black kids. And I think that was incredibly insightful, too. And the purpose of all of this is for you all to be educated, for, for you all to be a part of the discussion, right? Because you never know who could come onto the show next and voice an opinion or a thought that is very relevant to you and your life. So definitely reach out. Tell me what you want to hear about. Tell me what you want to discuss. Or hell, tell me if you want to be on the show. And maybe you can be that mouthpiece for somebody else who's listening. This is always fun. I can't tell you how much passion goes into the show. I can't tell you how much thought goes into the show. And I can't tell you how much love goes into the show. For all of you who want to send your condolences for my grandmother, I do appreciate it. I mourn in a weird way, so don't take it personally if I don't reach back out. And to everyone who wants to be a part of the show, you know how to contact me. And Reese's YouTube will be in the description of the show as well. This is always fun. I'm going to get going. i got a lot of editing ahead of me to get this out before midnight. So as always, I'll keep talking if you'll listen. Take care.